and last but certainly not least, Dr. Evan Smith is a rehabilitation psychologist and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at University of Michigan. He earned a bachelor's degree from Tulane University and completed his PhD in clinical psychology at Nova South Eastern University in Florida. He serves as the attending psychologist in the University of Michigan Multiple Sclerosis Center, a comprehensive center for MS care as designated by the National MS Society. His areas of practice include chronic pain, psychosocial adjustment to disability, MS, and acquired brain injury. Dr. Smith is passionate about expanding access to care, serving historically marginalized, underserved communities, and is the co-director of the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Health Equity and Anti-Racism Task Force. Dr. Smith will round out our fantastic group of speakers with his talk on optimized motivation toward a life well-lived with MS. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Okay. Well, that was a really lovely introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's really wonderful to be with everyone here today. Is that too loud or is that okay? It's good, okay. Um, just a couple of disclosures. I received an honorarium to be here today. Um, the presentation today is just a reflection of my opinions. They're not meant to be psychological treatment. Uh, I am a psychologist, but I might not be your psychologist. So just make sure that you take that into account. You've heard some from some really amazing experts here today. I also just wanted to recognize that every single person here and at home is the world's foremost expert on themselves. So the information you heard today is only as good as what you apply to you. A couple of goals for today. So we're going to learn some evidence-informed approaches to understanding motivation and engagement while living with MS. We're going to learn how to navigate some barriers to motivation and engagement. We'll talk about um, how to set SMART goals to live uh, the life well-lived towards uh, MS. A few topics that we'll cover today. Uh, we're going to review motivation and engagement. We'll talk about understanding values and value-based living with MS. We'll discuss some facilitators for motivation and some barriers that might inhibit motivation. And we'll also apply motivational enhancement techniques to daily living using smart goal setting. All right, so I know some of this is small, so I'll just say it. Um, motivation we can think of as the reasons one has for acting or behaving in a particular way. So think of your motivation as your why. And we'll get into how to really assess your why in a little bit. Um, this definition of engagement I took out of the rehabilitation literature, but they describe it as a co-occurring process and state. It incorporates a process of gradually connecting with each other and a therapeutic team, which enables the individual to become an active and committed and invested collaborator in their healthcare. So if motivation is your why, you can think of engaging as your motivation or your why in action. And each of you here have already demonstrated motivation to engage in this forum. So as we're talking about some ideas around motivation today, think about your why. What was it that brought you here today? What was it that helped you to tune in today? So I've got obviously a compass on the screen here. Um, I think we could think of values as being a compass, uh, a directional compass. It's a core concept to understanding motivation. Um, on the next few slides, you'll also see an icon of a compass. But knowing your most important values can really serve as a guide to navigating any obstacles that arise on your journey. Values aren't tangible. You can't see them or smell them or taste them or touch them. They're concepts. Um, they're ideas. They're, um, they're concepts about who we are and what we hold to be meaningful. They're not a destination or a goal, but an ever ongoing framework to approach daily living. They're also not good or bad or right or wrong. Some examples of values would be creativity, independence, freedom, trust, kindness, respect. They're sort of like individualized preferences or, or toppings on a piece of pizza. Um, 
you know, I don't happen to like pineapple on my pizza, but that doesn't make me a good or a bad person. And if you do, it doesn't mean you're a good or a bad person. It's just individual preferences. And we know that values are generally consistent in someone's adulthood, but they tend to, you know, evolve over our lifetime a bit. Um, as we experience and move through life, our circumstances, our commitments, our relationships and experiences change. And so naturally our values grow in with those changes. You know, my values from 15 years ago aren't the same values I hold now because they're uh, evolved to change with my life circumstances. And that evolution is important to recognize and, and evaluate with some regularity in service of creating greater alignment with what we live. And what we know from the literature is that when we are consistently behaving and acting in ways that align with our values, that tends to enhance quality of life for people living with MS. It also helps people to thrive. We also know that a misalignment between what we do and what we value leads to reduced quality of life over time and perhaps even suffering. This value-based compass can also give us some insight about our own motivations. In order to engage in an activity, a person must be willing and able. So it generally boils down to these two points. How confident are we that we could engage in a particular activity? And how important is it to, for us to engage in that activity? And that level of importance can be directly linked to how meaningful and aligned that behavior is with our most important values. So if you're wondering, how do I know what I'm ready for? There are a couple of questions you can ask yourself. On a scale from zero to 10, with zero being I have no confidence I could do this, and 10 meaning I'm certain I could, how confident am I that I could do this right now? And for importance, on a scale from zero to 10, with zero being this isn't important to me at all, or this is critically important to me as a 10, how important is this to me? The research would tell us if you're at about a seven out of 10 for both of them, you're probably gonna try it at least once. And if you're not at a seven or a 10, the next question you can ask yourself is, well, what made me say a five out of 10 and not a two out of 10? That's going to get you thinking about what were the facilitators of my motivation. And if you're at a five out of 10, we don't expect you to get all the way to a 10 out of 10 in one day. Ask yourself, what would move me from a five out of 10 to a five and a half today? What would have to change? That can give you some insight into what barriers you might have to navigate. So as a quick example, I am unfortunately a New York Jets fan. And um, let's say it's my turn to take out the trash. Now, if it's Monday night football and there's a minute left in the game, chances are I might have 10 out of 10 confidence that I could do that, but it's not nearly going to be as important as me watching the rest of the game. Now, they're probably going to lose anyway, but I still have to watch it. Um, now, once that barrier is removed, the game is over suddenly this becomes a lot more important to me because reciprocity is important to me, cleanliness is important to me. So now it kind of moves up my priority list. And we can also um, see this map on the other side of the screen. The map represents any number of situations that can arise in daily life or even your goals. Your values tell you what direction to go while your goals are the steps that help you to get closer to living the meaningful life that you want to. Now, this isn't every area of life, but these are a couple of really important areas of life that people think about when they're thinking about a, a life well lived. So when you're thinking about your values, how might they apply to each of these areas in life? For example, your health, how you decide to engage with your healthcare teams, what nutritional choices you make, how you go about movement, with family, taking on family roles and responsibilities, in your relationships, how you choose to communicate, or connect with people, or cultivate support networks. With education and work, is it about self-development? Is it about um, career orientation? And then spirituality, connecting with something, something greater than yourself, or even just the community involved there. So if our values can help us to understand our motivations, let's examine how we can amplify this, and, and how to take action, and also navigate barriers that might make it more difficult to engage in action. There are a couple of important facilitators that we know can help to enhance motivation, bringing intention to every day, planning ahead of time, uh, practice making these things daily routine if they're meaningful to you, so using your support networks, allowing them to be involved in your life, and using assistive devices. 
Now, there are really important barriers to engagement that I'm sure a number of you are aware of, fatigue, pain, low mood, and limited or even variable access on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we're thinking about how to navigate some of these barriers, let's talk about the big one, fatigue. Estimated affects about 70 to 95% of people living with MS. And I'll just share with you a brief tool on what you can think about if you're trying to navigate this really important and, and critical barrier. And the, the acronym is ADAPT. Awareness, delegate, adjust, prioritize, and time-based pacing. So we'll go through each one of these briefly. In order to be aware, let's think about the different sort of buckets of resources you might have on, a, on any given day. The motor or physical energy bucket, the cognitive energy bucket, and the emotional energy bucket. They're all interconnected, but we can also appreciate that if we overuse one of these areas, it might leave us susceptible to be particularly fatigued on a given day. So for example, when we're thinking about managing our day, if you are taking a break from, let's say, lifting weights, we don't want to take a break by doing push-ups and steps because that's pulling on that same area, that same bucket of resources. And similarly, if you've just been reading a textbook for two hours and you want to take a break, doing math problems isn't exactly going to be all that rejuvenative. So we want to think about mixing and matching these different areas of engagement. We also want to think about the patterns that we have in our life, how we behave in our life. They're not right or wrong or good or bad, but we just want to think about it um, in terms of alignment. And I kind of think about things in terms of short-term coping and long-term coping. Oftentimes, as well-intended as short-term strategies are, sometimes they can leave us susceptible to some unintended consequences. So on, on the left side of the screen here, we see that if we feel fatigued and the only solution we possibly have to managing that fatigue is resting or not doing, and fatigue is a long-term chronic issue, we might be doing a lot less in our life and our bodies might not be as prepared to do more. So over time, we might wind up doing less and less and less, and this winds up in the underdoing cycle. Alternatively, we have this boom and bust cycle that can occur when we think to ourselves intuitively, I've got some resources today, I better use them. I'm gonna go, 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 go. And then unfortunately, there's a point where our bodies tell us you can't go any further and there's no more pushing. And that, that's the point where we feel burned out. It can amplify other MS symptoms. And we're forced to dis discontinue the thing that we wanted to be doing. So it can actually lead to low mood and suffering along the way. So over time, we, we tend to see that this pattern leads us to doing less and perhaps even suffering a bit more. We'll come back to a more long-term approach in just a minute. Let's talk about delegating. <clears throat> Some days the to-do list can really take up a lot of headspace. And some days it looks like this. And other days it might look like this. And on days where your energy might not match this type of task demand, we want to consider delegating to the ones you love, the ones that are there to support you. Think about the tasks that are of least importance to you and that you're the least confident you can do and allow the people in your life to take those on. This strategy can allow for greater resources to engage in the things that actually mean more to you and are more accessible. Okay, next is adjust. So we're moving from thinking um, about functional goals in terms of one style or multiple pathways forward. The rigid approach to thinking would suggest that there is only one right way to do this. And that works really well on days where we got everything that we need, but on a day where it's variable, we don't necessarily have the energy we need, that one approach may not work so well. The functional approach would say, there are many ways to accomplish this goal. I'm gonna choose which one is most accessible to me today. So for example, on a day when the fatigue is heavy, and let's say the, the functional goal is to have a nutritious breakfast. Well, the rigid approach would say, I have to cook, cook a full breakfast, start to finish, crack the eggs, chop the vegetables. The functional approach looks more like I've prepared for this. I'm really grateful for the me that was there two weeks ago that made those frozen breakfast burritos. And now my breakfast is going to be ready in two minutes. So now we're coming back to this priority list and we're talking about prioritizing what you wanna do. 
prioritizing means doing the thing that mo- means the most to you and the thing that is most accessible and choosing where to dedicate your resources. Think of the activities that would yield the highest impact with perhaps the lowest effort and the least amount of barriers. And then we have time-based pacing. I'm not gonna go into all the ins and outs of this, but this is a skill that with practice can allow you to get the most out of an activity without pushing yourself so far that you feel entirely burned out. The strategy involves listening to your body and intentionally planning for alternating activity with rest. So for example, if your goal is to, let's say, walk with a mobility aid for 20 minutes, your body may or may not be prepared to do that. If it is ready to be walking for five minutes, we can set plans in place to walk for five minutes, rest for three, walk for five, rest for three, walk, rest, walk, rest. These intentional rest periods will provide the body an opportunity to rejuvenate, allow for less susceptibility to burnout, and allow you to do more over time, allow you to do additional things in your day. So we also now want to put this kind of into action. We understand what our motivations are to engage in meaningful activities, how to amplify this motivation, and navigate barriers. So let's make a plan to actually get active. But we don't just want to set random goals. We want to set smart goals. Um, We want them to be specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-based. So specific means identify who might need to be involved. What will they be doing? Where is this going to happen? When is it going to happen? And how do you see it happening? Measuring. Um, Achieving goals is usually never a straight path. Progress rarely is just linear. Um, So acknowledging progress is really important. And we could do this if we measure our progress. So let's say using time as a component. We can understand if we're making process to our walking goal if we've been measuring time the entire way. Action-oriented. Sometimes breaking up the big goal into small chunks um, allows us to approach it more easily. So think of the first three steps you might have to do to make this goal a reality. And then time, um, sorry, um, realistic. Focus on balancing optimism and a realistic approach in goal setting. What is accessible and what could I use to navigate barriers ahead of time? And then lastly, time-based. So goals should have some sort of endpoint. Set a realistic time frame in which to achieve those goals. So you might be thinking now, what can I do? Well, review and assess your own value set as a daily practice Remind yourself of that core set of values to strengthen your compass. Identify what strengthens your motivation and how to navigate barriers. So remember, adapt for fatigue. And then even consider setting a short-term SMART goal for the next month. Ask yourself, not what's going to change my life completely, but what could I do in the next month that would move me 1% closer to the life I want to live? Now, this is just, I know it's hard to see here, but I just wanted to point out how many resources there are in this amazing MS community. This is just a scratching the surface level uh, dive here, but these are some uh, resources I really like. We're talking about support groups, events, social media that you can follow, consuming media, listening to podcasts. MS is thought of as a condition of literal disconnection and figurative disconnection. So having this theme where we can reconnect with our community is critically important for motivation. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and have a great night.